To many anglers, the names of Bill McEwen and Loch Lomond are synonymous. Bill's love affair with the loch lasted over 30 years and became a passion which he wrote about frequently and enthusiastically. But it wasn't a selfish passion. Bill wanted every angler to share the delight he found in his loch of many moods. And that's what inspired this program. Regrettably, Bill didn't live to see its completion. And many of his additional comments and anecdotes were lost with him. This program remains as a tribute to Bill and the loch he loved so much. It's one of the largest areas of fresh water in the whole of Great Britain. And its bonny banks are famous the whole world over. It's the big loch, Loch Lomond. 27 and a half square miles of water containing some of the finest, most varied fishing to be had in still water anywhere. And you can reach it from Glasgow in half an hour. For the angler, the loch splits naturally into two parts, the bottom and the top end, although we anglers more affectionately refer to the latter as the tap end of Loch Lomond. The tap end starts at Adlui, the northernmost point of the loch, and it remains long, narrow and deep for about 12 miles till it meets the bottom end round about Rao of Denon, where the loch widens out into a triangular shape with its base along the southern shore. The sheer beauty of the top end brings visitors from all over the world. But it's not the easiest part to fish. It's deep, around 600 feet, and you don't catch many fish in such black depths. The shoreline provides more gradual shallows with stretches of clean shingle which the fish prefer. The problem here is that with the lochs and arrows, the winds are extremely variable and often disappear altogether, making drifting difficult. Unless, of course, you've got another pair of hands in the oars. The bottom end here, where the loch widens out, is the main area for the angler. And as it happens, for the tourists and the sailor too. For the angler, the bottom end is a mecca, for here are all the species that the big loch has to offer, both the game fisher and the coarse angler. Salmon, sea trout, brown trout, pike, perch, eels, and even roach, amongst others. And they're all easily accessible. The famous islands of Loch Lomond provide conditions for fishing to suit most winds and weather. For well, that's another thing about the bottom end that the top doesn't have. Plenty of wind, and no matter which direction it blows from, the position of the islands generally allow for good drifting over the fish holding areas. And the islands have another practical value too. They provide thankful shelter if you're caught in a sudden squall. For make no mistake, the big loch can be a dangerous place if you don't treat it with respect. And crashing waves can drive a small boat onto the rocks only too easily. While swimming around in the cold waters of too often pr prove fatal. Fortunately, for most of the year, such conditions are rare, but it pays to keep them in mind. You can fish out of Balloch, Luss, Inverbeg, or Rau of Denon, but many of the boats, like my own, prefer to be based here at Balmaha in the eastern shoreline of Loch Lomond. It's a big loch, right enough, and if you're new to it and thinking of fishing it, the very sight of such a huge expanse of water might rightfully put you off. Well, I'm here to show you how to make the most of fishing one of the biggest freshwater fish tanks in the world. Well, don't worry too much about that huge area of water out there. You can probably, in fact, delete most of it. The fish over the years have become accustomed to occupying certain lines, and, well, I hope to show you some of the fascinating little highways and byways where these fish lie, and hopefully tempt one or two into the boat for, for you. When I say fish, I'm going to concentrate, first of all, on those two silver beauties, the salmon and the sea trout. And who knows, we might even catch one or two in the process. Although, as always with angling, there are no guarantees, only problems to be solved. 
And the more information and experience we can amass to help us solve them, the more likely we are to find the right answers. So first things first, for any kind of fishing in the loch, you'll need four main things. The right tackle, the right clothing, the right boat, and of course the right information. Well, one of the first things to get right in this rather hostile lock, as it sometimes becomes, is one's clothing. And too often in the past, I've witnessed angler after angler going out in the loch, garbed in wafer-like cajoles and the like, and nothing across their lower regions at all. They return to the bay something resembling drowned rats. <laughs> For my part, I start from the, the body out wearing good thermal undergarments, layer upon layer of pullovers, a neck scarf, a traditional type of fishing jacket such as this with quite an ample hood. But most important, and probably most important of all, is to make sure that from the waist down, you are wearing a pair of PVC trousers. And although I'm not right now, I wouldn't dream of actually venturing out without them on because your derriere must be protected. <laughs> Trawling being what it is, we trail behind us in a boat three moving baits using three rods, and in my case, these are battered old relics, but they've served me well and caught many a fish. They're fairly cheap, solid fiberglass rods, eight to nine foot long, but the main essential is they have a, a very nice curve to them when playing a fish, and they're not on the brutal side. These are mounted, as we'll show you later, in outriggers and along the, the back of the boat. Three rods, therefore, are used. Uh, the reels are very important indeed. They can be old, certainly, but it's vital that they are sound. And at this stage, I should mention that the rings in the actual rod should have been of the very best quality obtainable. And there's only one word to describe, to my mind, the best rod rings for trawling, and that's Fuji. Coming back to reels, uh, I much prefer the fast retrieve type of multiplying reel, mainly because if you hook a fish in one rod, or the one bait at a time, it's very, very important indeed that you are able to reel in the two remaining baits out of the water quickly. And for that purpose, I can't see beyond a fast retrieve multiplier. But have it as you will. If your reels are sound and they've got a good check and line capacity, that will suffice and probably get you by. Now, there is no great complication with uh, trawling a line as such. I simply use myself, like most anglers in a lock, uh, a line of about 12 pound breaking strain of the best quality nylon. And of course it goes without saying that you should probably discard that at the end of each season or befall or <laughs> have some tragedies befall you that you don't necessarily want to happen. Another item which uh, for trawling is almost essential is a good ball bearing swivel mounted about four feet up the trace. And for that you can't beat probably the Sharps ball bearing type so popular nowadays. And now to the nitty gritty the actual baits that lure, hopefully, the fish you're about to catch, or sea caught. Yeah. Now, here we have um, a well-established bait called the Kind of Killer, or Lucky Lou, as it's known in America. And I always have a very soft spot indeed for this bait, because the actual man who made it so popular in Scottish waters, Ian Kind of, started off his fishing days where, you've guessed, Loch Lomond. This then is the American version, the Lucky Louie, our kind of killer, and it's been daubed with paint purely to my own ideas. This particular one's caught about probably a dozen fish in the last two or three years. The great joy of using a kind of is it fishes fairly deep, and that's where the salmon are to be had right now, in about three feet under the surface of the water. Another bonus is when the fish is hooked, the actual bait flies up the trace and stops at the, the mount. And while it's pirouetting through the water, the angler can see for himself the gyrations and pulses and trembles of the hooked fish. So it's really a kind of monitor you see on the surface. On to the end, we have a straightforward treble hook. And for my money, I haven't found a better hooking arrangement anywhere or on any bait. Very, very popular indeed in Loch Lomond and Loch Ness and some of the bigger lochs of the same type. 
is the fabulous old-fashioned golden sprite. Now, they're becoming a bit hard to come by, but here is an excellent uh, sample. It's about three and a half to four inches long, and as I hope you can see, it's been mounted rather carefully and bound with very, very fine copper wire. The idea being to give the bait a neat appearance and have it spin very, very fast, but at a slow speed through the water and on an even keel. And the idea being that when a salmon takes the bait, the, the copper wire will break and you're simply playing it direct onto the treble hooks. Probably the most important bait in Loch Lomond, the golden sprat. Now, there are various ways of dyeing a sprat and preserving it using a powder called acroflavine. But I, for myself, settled to the golden version, although other anglers prefer a deep red through hues of pink to sometimes a purpley color. But I will always manage to find rod room for one of these lovely little creatures in my boat. There are several other baits well worthwhile considering if you're trawling in Loch Lomond. And of course, who hasn't heard of the, the fabulous Toby made popular by Abu of Sweden? Now here is a silver variety as you would buy it in the shop. A fabulous bait for attracting fish, but unfortunately not the best hooker in the world. For that reason, I alter my ideas a bit in the shape of the bait to this form. This is a, quite an old one, but it's caught a fish or two. Now, as you can see, the fluttering treble is the thing that uh, causes the salmon to get off fairly quickly. It's in too many angles at the one time as it goes through the water for good hooking. So I mount it direct onto a piece of wire and a, a piece of copper wire onto the bottom here so that the actual treble is moving in sympathy with the bait itself. When the fish takes, the small bit of copper wire at the bottom breaks off and you're playing the fish direct onto the treble hook, the toby. One other bait, very, very popular indeed, is the Finnish Rapala. In this case, it's a golden one with a fluorescent pink body. I sometimes put this on in conditions of very bad light where I find fluorescence or reds of any color show up very well. It is a bait which is essential that it swims on its side, and if it doesn't, the answer is to bend the little ring at the very tip to have it swim on an even keel. Well, so much for baits. I think we could now move on to how to mount the actual rods and see how they perform on the water. And oh, incidentally, just before we go, a wee word about a few essentials to carry aboard a good Loch Lomond angling boat. And there are several ways of committing angling suicide, and one of them is to go out with an inadequate trout net, hoping to catch the fish of your dreams out in this great lock of ours. Now, I have here a very popular type of telescopic net with a very solid rim and, uh, most important, a good deep mesh. Uh, some anglers prefer, in fact, to put a piece of lead or stone in here. But this is an excellent uh, stretch type of rod. And uh, just to be on the safe side, I also carry aboard another means of landing a fish, a well-known piece of gear called a killer. Now, this one's been lying for a while and might be a little bit footloose and fancy free. But I use this for a really big fish when the hope it will come along. Uh, it's simply the fish primarily has got to be absolutely stone dead and played out in the surface. The ring of the tailor is taken up to halfway up the fish's body and then snap shut like so and the ring clasps onto the tail of the fish and in one movement she's brought aboard. I would caution uh, anyone who thinks of buying one of these tailors not to use it on a good sized sea trout simply because the tail of that fish tends to collapse under pressure and instead of lifting it out of the water you'll probably lift nothing out at all so the net's the thing for big sea trout. Uh, two other tiny but important things to carry aboard are a, at least a very basic toolkit, complete with the essential pair of scissors. These will never be out your hand in Loch Lomond, and a good pair of uh, pliers for extracting hooks and all sorts of odd jobs you'll find aboard. Boats, something like rods and anglers, can be a weird and wonderful mixture. For Loch Lomond, Practically any type of boat in the 15-foot length class is okay for trawling. And some even have the fitted luxury of cuddies. But since we are here to fish the loch all year long and not just trawling for a few months in the spring, 
we must ensure we have a boat that's able to drift well for the fly fishing later in the season. My own boat here is uh, an Irish model, 17 feet long, made of fiberglass, and on the first day out, she was very temperamental and skittish indeed. Since then, I've managed to ballast her up, and today she's one of the better, I hope, drifting boats in the loch. However, we're here to talk about trawling, since that's the method we're using straight away at the start of the season. And over there, we have a rod already fitted in its rest at probably the right angle to the water. Now, it's essential that that rod is not any lower than it is, because when a big wind comes up, it may dip into the wave troughs, and so might you in trying to recover it. Peculiar to Loch Lomond is the rod we fish out the middle or rear end of the transom. It's called the poker for reasons which have eluded me, but I presume in the old days it was because of its sheer short and stiff properties. Now let me show also the fitting of the outside rod. These rods are quite uh, freely available in tackle dealers, and there goes the outside rod. Presuming we are trawling in that direction, we therefore have three rods fitted at a good angle to the water. The shortest line fish will be on the poker rod, which fishes in the wake of the running outboard. Only a distance, I'd say, of about 15 feet at the most. A yard, sorry, 15 yards at the most. If we're traveling up the shoreline, this inside rod will fish about 20 to 25 yards. The longest line of all will be fitted in the outside rod and uh, will be trailing a length of line something like 35 to 40 yards. Well, as you can see, I'm pretty well armed with rods, but not only that, I'm wearing these vital sunglasses, optics cormorants. There is a tremendous glare in the water today, but that's not the only reason I'm guarding my eyes. Primarily, I wear these to see into the water. Since we're trawling down the Endrick bank, it's paramount that we comb that bank using depth as the guiding factor. And using these glasses, I can see the edge of the bank some five to eight feet deep and enable the boat to zigzag along. It will never be in a straight course, hence the goggles. And just a final wee word about engines. Uh, for this length of boat, there is no need to go much above, say, a five horsepower motor. In this case, it's a Honda, it might be any other type. Um, a Seagull, of course, is also a very well-kent motor down here. The vital factor with any outboard when you're trawling is that it doesn't stutter and stall and perform badly at slow speeds because that's all the speed you'll need. A tick over speed and regularity with it. Now, with the rods mounted just so, it's about time we made a start and get out there and see what we can do. Well, as we start the day trawling out from our base at Balmaha, the first thing to sum up is, of course, which direction the wind's coming from. Were it a north-west wind, for example, I would have to make the decision to turn left or right. And the way things are today, we're not going to have that problem because there's hardly any wind at all. If we had a good wind blowing from the northwest, we would head into Mance Bay, past the starting at the pier at Balmaha, and trawling up to one of the better-known lies at the top of the bay called the Black Rocks. It may have been a very good lie for some anglers in this loch, but not for me. The fish seem to hear me coming. I've been singularly unsuccessful there. However, maybe today we'll have a different story to tell. Um, at this stage, we will not do well unless we put the baits in the water. And having discussed, as I said, the theory in the bay, here it is in practice. We will feed out the outside rod first. Some anglers, when they're paying out line, 
put a little bit of cotton wool at the desired length they want to feed out, but I merely do it by the turning over of the reel and guess what comes into it here. Now, that's number one away. Clear this a little bit here. We could, at this stage, say we're fishing. There's one bait in the water. And now for the famous little poker with its plug bait attached. We slip this into the wake of the boat and a very, very short line. In fact, most of the time, I can see that bait dancing in the water. At the same time, we'll regulate the engine speed and get things under control. And finally, put one more bait out. There we go. And here goes a small version of the kind of killer, which seems about right for this windless lock today. Steady our course up a wee bit. And we are almost there. This particular trawl through Mounts Bay is very good early season-wise. And at the moment, we're crossing a very deep hole off the rocks at the pier, where, in fact, many years ago, I hooked and failed to land the biggest fish I've ever caught in Loch Lomond. Uh, I would estimate its weight something in the region of 35 to 40 pounds. It took like the wee tweak of a perch and to my astonishment, when the fish surfaced at the side of the boat, I got the fright of my life when I saw the weight of it. The wind was blowing very, very hard, a huge northerly blow, and it took me fully 40 minutes to drift down the area of the Endrick Bank in the background and present the net to it fatally, as it were, and the, the fish slipped to hooks. A slash of its mammoth tail, and that was the last I saw of it. However, every angler worth his salt has got some tail of disaster to relate. The trees just now are still a bit barren, but there's a bit of green coming through. This particular bit of shoreline is rocky, sunken out crops of rock, which if you're new to the lock, you're bound to make some kind of connection with. Unfortunately, there's, only, there's, there's no easy way to learn it. It's early May in the loch, and uh, it is, if anything, my favorite fishing month. Um, apart from my birthday having fallen on the first uh, I've always been fairly lucky to get a fish round about the 1st to the 12th of the month. We will cease trawling about the end of the month, and the way the weather is going this year, it looks as if we are in for an early start in fly fishing. I've noticed lately quite a good patch of fly, and the small trout were dimpling the other day as we sat in erstwhile calm conditions. So it looks as if we're all set for a good early start in fly fishing. But at the moment, we'll carry on with the trawls or the harrows, as it's known elsewhere. By the time May comes, much as I enjoy seeing a fish caught in the trawl, I find the tedium catches up a bit, and I'm desperately keen to get that big fly rod going and get the first rise of the season, if not the first fish. Well, this is the centre of Man's Bay, and one would sweep it as, probably as close as 20 feet off the shoreline. I find it's not the greatest taking point. I've had the odd fish in the centre of the bay, but off the bow, we have an area which holds good salmon at this time of year. I'm using at the moment a three plug bait. I discarded the sprat for the time being in the hope that a little ripple might come up where it will look more natural. But frankly, it would take quite a miraculous bait to move anything in this set of conditions. We are praying anxiously that a wind will come along. The drill, by the way, which is fairly important, and especially if you're angling solo, as I do most of the time, the real commotion starts when a fish is hooked. For example, if a fish suddenly took that bait, the last thing I would do is move over and lift the rod. Most novices do this and manage to lose a fish quite easily. I would simply give the engine a slight rev up so to set the hooks home. And my main duty then is to get the other two baits as quick as possible out of the water and enable me to concentrate on the playing of the fish. The next thing to enter my mind would be to aim the boat out to an adequate depth, especially if there's a good wind blowing and the knowledge that the boat would be blown in shore fairly quick. Trawl the fish out, just like a big puppy dog, without much jerking at all, keeping a steady strain on it to an adequate depth, and then play it out. I see some fellow anglers are having a little outboard trouble. Nothing new in this lock. <laughs> 
Well, there are very few occasions in the loch when you would trawl your boat in an exactly straight path. It's due to two reasons. One, the habitat of the fish and getting to know the various lines they take up in the loch. Another reason is that for some reason or other that's baffled most of us, salmon in particular, are extremely fond of taking a bait when you turn the boat. My own theory is that they think the bait is escaping and when the boat is turned, there is slight line given and the sprat, for example, will start to sink and behave in a quite erratic manner. This does bring out very strange behaviour in the fish themselves. But whatever the reason, it is a fact that when the boat is turning, salmon will often take. This particular shoreline I'm trawling is quite intricate. It varies from sand to very big, flat-shaped rock. Uh, we may seem, on the face of it, to be rather deep, but in practice, this is where I've caught any fish in this particular bay. A very popular area is the Manse Bay, as we can see from the boats passing to and fro. And it's not per chance, it's simply because it happens to be a very good early season lie. Not particularly rated for sea trout, but heavy salmon, yes. I recall one of fully 28 pounds being taken here as little time ago as two years ago. It took, if I remember, a red sprat, a trolled red sprat. La, 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 la. Loch Lomond then is quite unique and so is the various methods of boat communications between anglers afloat. We have on Loch Lomond a veritable ministry of silly signals and as such I've never seen its equal in any loch in Scotland. Most days uh, the basic signal would be describing a large circular nothing by hand so. For example, if a boat was passing me on the port side, I would signal thus and expect to get the same signal returned, a large circle, which means that I've caught nothing in the same boat is almost as daft as I am. Had I a suspicion that the other boat had caught a fish, I would uh, receive the signal back one, one digit, one finger held up to me. I would immediately then want to know the weight of the fish and I would display my own fingers to the boat, the, the, the capturing boat. He in turn would go like something like this and signal back seven, which means to me that he's got a seven pound fish. There would be slight puzzlement on my part. I'd want to know if it was a salmon or a sea trout, so I would give this signal to ask him to show me the fish, which is simply raising a fish so by the tail, as it were. I would then examine the fish visually and make my mind up whether he's telling me the truth or not, whether it is a salmon or sea trout. There are, apart from these basic signals, many other uh, signals afloat, such as if you've hit a fish and lost it, you would probably go something like that, bang, bang, and oh, he's away, he's off. And it's amazing how many times you get that signal to you. There are other ones, such as it's a damn cold day out here, or very quiet, nothing much doing. In fact, there's very little we can signify to each other afloat. But most days out, that's all you'll need. Well, here we are approaching my pet dilemma, the famous black rocks, or otherwise known as Arakimore Point, at the very limit of Manse Bay. We would at this stage turn the boat around and comb through the same waters as we've come through. Beyond the black rocks, which is a difficult area to trawl, we have another famous bay, probably one of the most famous in Loch Lomond, Malaraki Bay. When I was a mere youth and started fishing here, I heard the rumour that a well-known angler called Ian Wood had captured five salmon off the green point tucked in at the corner of uh, Malaraki Bay. The same angler, one week later, beat his own record in capturing seven salmon, totalling something like 87 pounds off the top of my head. Now, that record still stands as a catch for the day. And talking of records, we can't keep the ladies out of this lock. In fact, a Mrs. Lecky Ewing way back in the 30s, I think it was, managed to hook and land a prime salmon of fully 36 and a half pounds off the island of Inch Pad across from us here. Uh, that record still stands to this day, so that uh, if you're thinking of bringing your wife down, I would not too readily pass the rod over to her and save yourself some blushes.
Well, we've trolled Mounts Bay and not done too well. And we are now passing the famous angling headquarters of Balmaha in the eastern shoreline, well known in the world over to anglers, and heading to probably the most famous part of Loch Lomond, the famed Endrick Bank. Now, if you travel the world over and meet a fellow angler in the remotest parts, and he mentions to you the Endrick Bank, you can be sure he knows his Loch Lomond. Not only is the bank famous for its marvellous spring salmon, it also has great reputation the world over for pike fishing. These are, in fact, English pike anglers, and they are nestling in at the famous Cromar Bay area, a, a very famous spot for spawning pike. Well, we're facing the mouth of the River Endrick as it outflows into Loch Lomond. And round about here, we have a tremendous passage of small fish, particularly smolts in the month of May, who will drop down the Endrick, pass us here at the mouth, drop through the loch, down the river leaving and into the sea. But my goodness, their route is full of hazards. The large specimen pike we have in the loch have got themselves well placed for an attack on these lovely little smolts and any other small prey that may be passing this way. There are days, I think there's so many small fish buzzing around here, we would really need a traffic warden to sort things out. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the very best of the Hendrick Bank and the trawl would start at the mouth where we are right now. And we will not, in fact, run in any kind of straight course as we go down this curious bank. The reason being that it silts up and shelves, and the best way to treat it, in fact, is like a meandering little river with depth being paramount in your mind, sticking to a depth roughly of perhaps six feet. Now, wandering too shallow inshore will enable you to pick up anything but a salmon, more likely debris and general weed. And too deep is also taboo. It's essential that you comb it in the depth of about six feet. Now, I affectionately refer to the bank as the Bank of Scotland here because it's got so many glitteringly silver prizes. And the salmon have a marvellous built-in radar system, as most of us are aware, coming back from Greenland. They will sense the mouth of the Leven, swim through the western shoreline of the loch, and nine times out of ten, Endrick fish will lodge themselves somewhere along this famed bank. They unfailingly sense the river of their birth and will remain here in, in most conditions throughout the season until they're ready for spawning. The bank is a difficult area to fish, and if we do get big winds, due to the sand content below us, it can silt up very bad, and neither the angler nor the fish favours this. In fact, the salmon will then move off to cleaner, rockier climes and follow them. Believe me, we must. Well, you know, apart from uh, protecting your eyes from glare, the real reason I'm fond of wearing polarised going down the Hendrick Bank is to keep my eyes into the water and watch the varying depths I would, in fact, feel myself somewhat deprived to be minus my Polaroid glasses going down this famed area. Just a final wee word of caution as regards the Hendrick Bank itself. It is, in fact, one of Britain's biggest and most important nature reserves, and it would behove us to treat it accordingly and not go ashore and blatantly disturb some of the wonderful wildlife we have present. In fact, rumour has it today in the early, early May that we have uh, a landing, if not a sighting, of a black swan. And not so many years ago, we had another strange visitor to the bank in the shape of a pink flamingo. A strange visitor indeed. In fact, it was an escapee from Edinburgh Zoo, I believe. But while I'm about to feed out my own particular favorite bait for the Endrick Bank, the ubiquitous golden sprat, and as you'll see, the essential ingredients of this bait are that it spins on an even keel. Uh, we already showed you how to mount the bait in the bay, and you can now see that I'm about to feed it out and hope that a fish appreciates its built-in qualities. We are, in fact, approaching the very end of this half mile of salmon water, the Hendrick Bank, and it concludes here at the famed Net Bay. 
And I think, if I look back, I could probably plead guilty to having caught perhaps as much as half of my Loch Lomond salmon in the trawl in the net bay, or certainly very adjacent to it. As we come into mid-May, many angling boats prefer trawling around the islands, in fact. And we could leave Balmaha and trawl in Shkeliuch, Torrinch, Creinch, and the shoreline of the biggest island in the Loch in Shmurn. For myself, I prefer to save these cherished shorelines for fly fishing later on in the month. And the way the weather is going, I think the last week of the month would be on my schedule for swishing away with the fly rod. Well, in returning from Net Bay towards Balmaha, we're still running parallel to the Hendrick Bank. And we should, in fact, be a distance of some 200 yards offshore in keeping to the same depth as I mentioned earlier on of 5 to 8 feet. Uh, it can be an extremely dangerous bank if the wind's coming down in a howling rage from the north. If you do go too shallow, the boat could grind to a standstill, and I wouldn't care to describe how much water you would ship. We're staying in the correct depths of water, five to eight feet. On the left of me, I should be able to see black depths, and on my right-hand side, the glint of brown sand. The balance of these two would tell you you're combing the bank exactly at the depth that's required. A final wee word of caution. It would be a very funny individual who didn't occasionally stray in too shallow, and thereby pick up all sorts of stray muck and debris and weed. So therefore, it does pay when you're trawling the Hendrick Bank to reel in from time to time and check your baits for any kind of weed. So far, I haven't managed to land a salmon with a bait impaired with any kind of foul matter at all. Well, off the port bow, we see one of the tiniest islets in Loch Lomond. It's called Aber Isle, and a more dangerous little place to approach I cannot imagine. It was originally, in fact, a lake-dwelling place, Aber meaning the aber at the mouth of the river. Its significance to us, however, as, as anglers, is to note its position as we carefully glide down on the trawl going down the Hendrick Bank. For example, halfway down the bank and right opposite aber, we have a hole known as the Firstry Hole. And we anglers do, in fact, use it as a good means of locating our fishing bearings. Well, I'm afraid it's been one of those days, be calm, bothered, and bewildered. The lock is like a sheet of glass now, and I'm sorry to say it looks as if we will be making back to base.
and we were hoping to see the real thing, and I'm glad to tell you that one angler from Balmaha Bay has, in fact, produced the goods today in the shape of this massive, beautiful 22, oh, 22 pound salmon caught on the trawl. And this is a sample of the very finest type of fish we get in Loch Lomond. 22 pounds and fresh out the sea. Well, I'd like to ask the captor what bait the fish took and what, in fact, did it take, Colin? Well, it's got enough red and gold rapala. Uh huh. And, yeah, I see. Uh, <laughs> about four, four to five inches long. That's yeah. the bait there. Well, we're a bit at long range, yeah. but this is, in fact, the Norwegian rapala, gold with an orange back and it has a marvellous fluttering action in the water. And the proof of the pudding is lying at our feet right here. Now, where did you catch it actually, Colin? Uh, Malaraki Bay. Malaraki Bay, well that was one of the most famous bays in Loch Lomond, just round the corner from Balmaha. Uh, was it the inside rod or outside rod? Inside rod. Inside rod. Fishing very shallow, just on the shelf. Uh -huh. Front of the burn. Front of the burn. Yeah. What sort of depth of water are we in, do you think? Well, it's probably be about six, seven feet. Six or seven feet. Well, that's the, the normal depth we would look for salmon at this time of year. But uh, from Loch Lomond today, we can report the capture of maybe about ten salmon into the bay already. Um, well, just have another look at this chap again. <laughs> Now, uh, if you see a better looking fish from anywhere else but Loch Lomond, my name's not Bill McEwen. I've seen them from all sorts of rivers, and I still maintain that the best come out of Loch Lomond or the Leaven. To tackle a loch from summer onwards to the very last day of October, there are two methods to use. One is wet fly fishing, and the other is dapping. And it is time to change our tactics and methods accordingly. The trolls can now rest in the boat. Apart from the occasional use as the season goes on, we won't be needing them very much now. Of course, we're obviously enjoying a very sunny May day. And if I had to sit down and write the actual conditions I would like to have for a day's fly fishing or dapping, they wouldn't be all that far removed from today. I'd like a little less brightness. In fact, my favorite day of all is an overcast day with a little smear of rain and a dirty look about the place in general. That's when the fish seem to see very, very clearly. Now, the actual rods, which I use, this is the wet fly rod. It's made of that lovely modern material carbon. It's 15 foot long. And onto it, I have a tapered cast of 10 pound nylon with three flies a description of which I will tackle a little later on. So much for the fly rod. And now we have the dapping weapon, which is a very humble, inexpensive hollow glass rod, some 14 and a half feet long, onto which we have spooled up with dapping floss, knotted every foot or so, terminating in four feet of nylon and this lovely dapping monstrosity, a hairy kind of Mary. So with these two methods, we should attract most of Loch Lomond's fish. And the real joy to me is that all the action from the boat is an extreme close-up. I've been fishing now for about over 30 years down here, and I still have found no substitute at all for the crashing rise of a fish under the very gunnels to either the dap or the fly. Well, we've looked at the respective rods and the merits of their length. The wet fly cast will probably be in the region of uh, 13 feet long, with the flies spaced some three feet apart. I always fish three flies to the cast, and easily my favorite for starting off in the early summer would be a very well-known fly locally called the Ian Wood, which is named after a well-known angler of yesteryear who created a record which will never be beaten in Loch Lomond, I suppose, of five, seven salmon to 77 and a half pounds. Not bad going. Well, that's his fly, the Ian Wood, a gold body, a turkey wing, and an orange hackle. A great deal of flash in that fly, which is very suited to the bright day we've got. 
On the middle of the cast, I'd put a smaller fly, and that was on the Ian Wood, in fact, was a size six for early season fishing. I would put this little chap here, a woodcock mix size eight in the middle, because it's likely there'll be an odd sea trout about in the month of May. Now, quite important is the actual tail fly, a point fly as it's sometimes called, and I, throughout the season, favor a double hooked version, although I'll stick probably to only about two or three patterns. This double hook here is a size eight, and the actual fly is a modified Invicta with an orange hackle. Every bit is good, and depending on the light conditions, is the well-known silver Invicta, which again, I've dressed in a size, well, it's probably a size seven double hook. Makers don't make the odd numbers nowadays. Now, sublime to the ridiculous, wet flies are ni nice, neat little things. I cannot possibly accuse dapping flies of being so attractive, but they do their job and serve a purpose. They're very, very heavily dressed, spider type of dressing. And they, of course, they're greased with silicone before they alight on the surface of the water. I don't use many patterns of dapping flies. I find about three tones of brown is more than enough to go through this season. And this one here is a honey-colored fly with a pair of big lugs sticking out. Very good attractor of fish, and I have it fitted with a treble hook, an Esmond Drury treble hook, actually, for days of big wind, and we get plenty of that down here. Well, you know, if I hadn't been an angler, I certainly could have been a tackle dealer, because in my early days in Lomond, I amassed literally hundreds of flies. They nestled in my box and didn't really get produced all too often. Today, I hope I have a little more sense, and I carry much, much fewer patterns. Probably about eight in all will see me through the entire season. Now, if you, in fact, are a trout angler and intending to visit Lomond, don't worry too much about our local patterns here because nestling in your box are a range of flies which will suit Lomond quite well. I'll ream off a few. For a sunny day, I put on a kingfisher butcher in the bob, a woodcock and mixed in the middle, a mallard and claret, a grouse and claret on the tail. Now, I think every trout angler carries such patterns. They do very well in Loch Lomond. I have a tendency myself towards yellowish flies, quite somber-hued flies, and the other extreme, I'm very fond of turkey wing flies and silver bodies. Um, well, that is probably the amount of flies I carry today, and I guarantee I don't use half of them throughout the season. I am very, very fussy if I get this box wet sometime or other, that the flies are all taken out and dried because hooks rust very quickly. And the last thing you want to do is break in a fish through some carelessness of your own. So there we are, that sees me through a season. I have a smaller box here, which I reserve for flies tied on double hooks. And the biggest I'll have in this box is probably around a size six. As the year goes on into July, August, I'll be down to little 10 doubles perhaps in the silver Invicta and the ordinary Invicta type of pattern. A fly which I did do quite well with last year came all the way from Ireland, from the famous Kingsmill Moor, and that is his Kingsmill tail fly, Little Double. So therefore, don't despair. You don't need thousands of flies. If you stick to these patterns as I do, you should be able to entertain the fish from the start of this summer that we're having right on to the very last day. So there we are, we've got the rods up, we've selected our flies, tied their casts up, and it's time now to set sail and move off to some of the better known drifts in the lock. Well, we're a fair ways up the loch now, at the Ross Point, and the rock is actually showing. Of course, the loch level is so high, we would normally see an awful lot more of that rock. But years ago, it was the start of the measured mile for motorboat racing in the days of k -Don. But nowadays, it's a very short and important drift to anglers, starting to fish the famed pilot bank of Loch Lomond. It's a very short drift and requires good judgment as to how you set the boat up. 
But nine times out of ten, if there haven't been many trawlers around it, there's a chance of a fairly big fish. The object here is to set the boat up, in this case in a southerly kind of wind, so that we skim the face of the rock. You can probably do it in a series of two or three drifts, but fairly close in is the ultimate here. Cast the flies almost up the shore of the rock itself. And there we go, the boat's correcting itself now and drifting in, in fact, quite good. As per usual, we have a slight, slight problem with the sun shining behind us, albeit it's a bit filtered. Oh, there we have one at us already. There was a, an abortive rise from a sea trout there to the middle fly, I think. He touched but did not take hold. I don't think it was all that big. Nice to see a rise just the same. Yes, we're skimming the rock quite nicely. And this is the way to do it, whichever way the wind is, from south or north. Fairly tight in. Oh, and another rise. I think we have a shoal of black nebs in here, folks. Two abortive rises. Nothing too big. It just shows that we're probably doing it right. So getting the depth right is very important here. You'll notice that I am not casting directly in front of the boat at all here. I'm casting to the lie where the fish are, which is just off the rock, drawing the cast in at an oblique angle. This also helps cheat this glaring sun from behind. Well, as I mentioned, it's a very short drift, but a quite an important one. There's always the chance of a big lone fish off this rock, the Ross Point. And we'll now continue this drift by fishing the famed pilot bank. We'll have a look at that round the corner in just one minute. Well, we can conclude here and proceed to the pilot bank. There's a black dog nestling up in the bow of this boat named Pilot, and we are at his actual birthplace, as it were, in Loch Lomond today, the famous pilot bank. It's about six miles steaming time from Balmaha, and it is shaped similar to a horseshoe. Now, since the lock is so high today, we've lost an identification pole. It's a white stake, which uh, is roughly facing ahead of us. And the wind is fickle and from the south, and much prefer, as always, a northerly wind for the pilot bank. However, the fish this area contains is absolute legend. And one good piece of advice, if you're fly fishing it, to estimate the right depth, turn around and make sure that you can, most of the time, see the spire of Lush Church in the background. And that will help you identify depth, particularly with salmon. Now, the area itself holds salmon, sea trout, and towards the back end of the season, the odd, big, heavy lock trout. Of course, the whole area is tucked away nicely below the famous Ben Lomond. And, uh, in the distance, we can see a white boat approaching a famed point of the pilot bank called Renoriki Point. And I hope the same boat treats it with diligent care. Beyond the white boat lies Milleros Bay, which we'll fish later on. An extremely important bay as far as Loch Lomond goes because it is 
facing onto one of the biggest spawning berms in the area, the Keelymore Burn, and it is bound to contain fish right up to the very last day of the season. I'm going to change my flies around a wee bit here. Sometimes it pays to switch to the dap when you're given enough wind. Especially good, I find, is dapping off this particular point in Oriki. Well, we've got not just adequate strength of wind for this yet, but we'll try and almost force it out. Some parts of Loch Lomond give a better response to the dap than others. For example, even in this short area, the pilot bank in Oriki, I found the response to the dap much better off this Renoriki point than the actual pilot mic. Don't ask me to, to explain why, unless it's the proximity of trees and insect life being blown into the water. Sometimes I think they often take this concoction for a heather moth. But nobody really knows what the dapping fly is taken for. And it's mainly taken just because it's simply there, annoying them. Not so, not so clever right now. Well, given a fair dapping wind, I would almost give this one go with the dap. And uh, if nothing came up, revert to the wet fly as usual. But it just so happens in the past, I've caught a good number of fish in the dap off this point. The best months for dapping here are probably July right on to late October. One little tip I would mention with the dap, I've caught in my lifetime in Lomond salmon, maybe a grilse or two. Not a big total, admittedly, but... And I have noticed when I have hooked a salmon, I've been dragging a little wake, such as I'm trying to do right now. Salmon seem fonder of a wake in the dapping fly. Sea trout will take it in a fairly static fashion. I'm hoping one will come up to prove the point. The wind's not helping as much. That's better. You got that. <laughs> oh, that was lovely. That was a bloody good fish. <laughs> now, that was slamming it with his tail. He didn't take it just right. I certainly fancied the look of the dam. God, that was a big fish. It's a big one. That was dragging. Oh, see that? Oh, we're getting action here. That was a wee one there. It was dragging, oh, see that? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I janked it out of his mouth. <laughs> Too small. There's a wee area here. I'll take that sooner or later. It's a big bugger to take that. Well, it was a good five pound in that first one. That's what we're after. No, she's coming in, folks. Save the dap for a little stronger breeze. And we're up to the wet fly. Another great spawning area off the pilot bank is Milleros Bay, which we're starting to drift into. And it contains a very, very big spawning burn called the Keelymore Burn, and there will be an abundance of fish around here They're waiting to get up, and already probably hundreds are up, in fact. But uh, it's early days and we'll have fish still covered with sea lice around this district. A long way off ready to go up any kind of burn, and that's the kind of fish we are in fact after. It's a fairly shallow bay and normally has a landmark in the shape of a cairn dead centre about 10 yards offshore, but 
Just to illustrate how high Loch Lomond is this year, we can't even see the top of the cairn. So in fact, we are so far above the mean height this year that uh, it's very, very difficult to pinpoint some of our more famous landmarks. The joy of this bay is it can be fished in almost any kind of wind. It's a big enough bay. And you can drift left to right, right to left, or straight down either side of the cairn when you see it. Well, probably we're looking at the start of the top end as opposed to the bottom end of Loch Lomond. And the, the little island nearest the shoreline is called the Inner Ross Isle. Beyond that, it's fairly barren water up to Rower Denon, and then still heading way up northerly. We have famous points like Tarmingan Point, Romore Point, Rahoish, and on the opposite shoreline, sweeping down from the left-hand side, quite a good point called Thirkin Point, where you can actually fish and almost touch traffic moving alongside you on the nearby road. But by and large, the western shoreline is nowhere near as good as the eastern. Well, that's not exactly a skating rink you've just seen out there. It is still Loch Lomond. And we're sitting here becalmed, bothered, and slightly bewildered because we're suffering a fit of the doldrums. No wind, but a lovely overcast sky, and we're sitting here playing a waiting game. It's absolutely useless for fly fishing, trawling even, or dapping, naturally. But there's one point I would like to bring out for those who probably would lose a lot of hope in these circumstances. And that is, don't waste your time when it does go calm. Pull in ashore, get out your fly box, check through your flies, check all these casts that are badly mounted, flies that are tied on back to front. There's all sorts of odd jobs in your haversack waiting on you. But more important than anything is to try and endure, and pass the time well, because if a wind does come up, and it's now late afternoon, if a wind does come up around about tea time, five o'clock, the fish then tend to give us a tremendously good response. They are just as anxious for a bit of joie de vivre than, than, than we are. So hang on, wait on, and don't lose hope and retire from the scene too early. Many's a time I've seen anglers wending their way home, thinking all is lost, only to see a boat sail out from Balmaha Bay into a lovely evening wind. And it's then you know you've guessed wrong. So sit it out, have a cup of tea, and enjoy the scenery. Well, we suffered a day of flat calms. The small island of Buckinch here can often be a rewarding drift. It's certainly not a long one, but if you concentrate on the, the tip for the big tree falls into the water, at the southern end of it, you might get a reward. Mostly sea trout and the occasional big salmon. The best wind for Buckinch is probably out the east, or alternatively, the south. And it pays to skim the shoreline quite closely. On the right of the Luss Hills, extends the tip of the second longest island in the loch, Inchlonig the Isle of the Yew Trees. On the left, at the gap, is the tail end of a very insignificant island, as far as angling goes, anyway, in Stavanach. But for the purposes of this exercise, we won't be paying it much attention.
Can you follow the bob? No, I can't no. really follow the bob. Oh, oh, jeez, oh, did you see that one? Well, I was on it. Oh, you were not, were well, you? Oh, Shing's alive. He missed it by a fraction of a bloody inch. Oh, God. Hell's bells. Right at the death. I'm running, by the way. Good. Oh, my God. Say this is about the right stretch of it. Well, to my mind, we're fishing in exactly the right strength of wind. The size of wind I'd always be looking for. It's ideal for getting the bob fly up at a fair distance and trickling it through the wave tops. Yeah, so much so that uh, we've just risen a good sea trite off the tip of the Ladies Point of Inch Crew and Island. And we're hoping, late as it is, to come away with some good in our creels. Well, away in the far distance, we can see the long point of Inchmoan Island extending out quite a ways with two very late angling boats trying to get a late kill. Certainly one of the most famous points in the loch. And I have, in fact, killed more than a few fish in an east wind off it, such as we've got right now. Oh, right into one now, at last, late or never. A very good sea trout. There you go, here he's coming up to the top. He's on quite a shot, I think he's on the bob fly. Yes, and he's fankled up the line. He has run round one fly round another. And sounding a bit deep now. He has fankled something, he's slept over the bob. Jerking his head is mad. Yes, I can see a fly. He's flipped it round with his tail. Plenty of fight in this guy. Oh, he is away on a real dash. Oh, he's off. Botheration. Oh, holy Moses. Holy cow, he's off. Well, I think that was a very clever sea trout. Well, I'm just going to keep on casting to heck. Holy Moses, after all that. You don't stick flies in your heart, do you? No, because Bad really, habit, isn't it? Really, well, it yeah. is. Bad habit. I've left my, half my fly box at home in, this, in the hat. Because <laughs> yeah. really? I stick them in there and I can't get them They, they tend to rust up. Oh, yeah. yeah. But put these on here that have used, and then they don't go back oh, to yeah, the box. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the best thing I find for f flies and cats in general is a simple manila envelope. Yeah. yeah. I've tried everything, but uh, it dries out the hooks. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Keeps the rest away. Yeah. Can be simpler. Mm. But anyway, yeah. I have with me today two visitors from over south of the border. Two first-time visitors, I might say. We have Mick here and Bill, both men of Northampton, who are up visiting Lomond for the very first time. And you're into, what is it now, your third day? Third day. Third day? Yeah. yeah. yeah now, tell down. me the big hundred dollar question. Do you like Loch Lomond? Oh, it's terrific. Aye? It really yeah. is terrific water, yeah. <laughs> Magic. I mean, you never yeah. know what you're going to catch. What, what water have you come from? What type of fishing do you do it's down south? The we rainbows come from and browns. Rainbows, Scott. yeah. And yeah. we can have blanks on there, but we, we haven't had a blank on there. Each day we've had fish. Yeah? Good fish, you know. Yeah? yeah. Good sport. Yeah, well, you've arrived at precisely the right time this year, as you know. Um, what sort of lures are you? Have you been using lures or orthodox flies? No, we've been using orthodox wet flies. Oh. Yeah. Such yeah, as I see here. Yes, yeah. 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 Lovely. Yeah. Mostly in, on eights, eights, but occasionally mm -hmm. a ten has taken fish. But yeah. the, the, the big bumble on the top, that's been the fly that's been catching. The claret bumble, I think you told me that the other night. The golden olive. The golden olive, olive bumble, bumble, yes. Oh, yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah. 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 Kingsmill lure. You know, yeah, yeah. Similar to an Invicta. Mm -hmm. And uh, Frank and Bevan, your own book tells us to oh, use yes. an invector, so... Yes, well, you must you know, obey the masters. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> right yeah. or wrong. I mean, uh, well, you've got to start from I was going to ask you what I should use this week. You've yeah. done so well. Well, yeah, yeah, done bad. I mean, Bill's top the lot. <coughs> what sort of fish have you had? We're up to five, five, and... Five-pound sea trout, Five-pound, five-pound sea trout, yeah, five-pound, five ounces. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, how was the fight from these fish compared to what you left behind you? Well, I think he he, he fought like a brown. He went. He, he kept wanting to bore down. He didn't. Bore he didn't run. Him. A rainbow mm -hmm. would have run away from him. Mm -hmm. But he mm -hmm. kept boring down. You know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he didn't yeah. show on the top, no. you know. It, it was good, though. Yeah. Powerful, very, very oh, powerful. powerful. I yeah. like the two of the two pan class that were electric. Yeah. Electric. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was instant transmission. It was there one minute and gone the next. Well, it's push-button stuff here. Yeah, you know? it really was. <laughs> you yeah, just turn on what you want. It's superb, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you, but you really don't know what you're getting into, no. do you? I mean, well, that's fact about Loch Lomond. Uh, you can be fishing here, rise a finnock. Next minute, hook a sea trout. Yeah. And the very next cash, uh, a salar, salmon, will while come up to you. While I was so it's really a matter of getting the rise timing right. That's right. And yeah. it's difficult because you don't know what class of fish you're going to expect. I mean, I'm using a, an 11 foot 6 rod, uh -huh. uh, which yes. is standard um, eliminator type mm -hmm. fishing rod down south. Sure. What well, do you think the 10 foots? You know anybody who didn't want to spend a lot of money but wanted to fish I've the I've got away with the 10 foot. I've played the you, five you five five fished five a 10 foot, yeah. 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 It's not my personal choice. I would never fish less personally than 12. Yeah. I'd like to, but yeah. it's finance. Finance. Well, if you're geared up for rainbows, yeah. you can safely come up here with your 10 foot right. rod and yeah. get away with it and enjoy yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're fishing here regular, I would suggest a 12 foot rod, both for the loch and the local rivers. It suits it eminently well. And of course, I go over the score and use a 15 foot rod for various reasons, um, getting my bulb fly up quick, spacing the flies miles apart, literally. Yeah. And uh, as we were talking about uh, earlier on, the actual hooking of the fish, the tightening. That's right, It's so much yeah. simpler with a long line. It's simply a short lean back and you're on. I can't leave this vast water without mention of its many and variable moods, and believe me, it's a loch that should be treated with the greatest of respect. As an angler, you're concentrating in the square footage of water in front of the drifting boat, but sometimes it behoves us all, or pays us, to turn around and have a look at what's over your shoulder. A Loch Lomond gale can be a living nightmare, but luckily we've got a galaxy of islands throughout the loch and there's almost a lee shore we can beat to when conditions turn really nasty. But believe me, the right clothing and the right attitude is most important in fishing this loch.
Well, after the rain has just eased off, we've hooked into the most beautiful salmon I've seen in a long time. And as you'll see here, he's actually run me miles into the backing. We're fishing off Inchfad Island, and he's given two tremendous leaps. And my job here now is to recover line. There he goes, he is absolutely miles away from this boat. And there's taking line off at 100 miles an hour. By Jove. Now, I'm not long to go in the backing here. I may have to start the engine and follow this chap. That is an enormous amount of line this man has taken. And as you'll see from the bend in the rod, he looks well into double figures. We've just started casting and the mildest little wind went up this crater came at 100 miles an hour. Well, I may, as I say, I have to start the engine. I just did not have time to get me bonnet on even when this fellow appeared. Well, if he's not a salmon, he's certainly a very big sea trout. So now we're coming to the very important stage. He is at least going by my backing too many yards, about 120, 30 yards away from us. I might start the engine. Now he's coming, albeit slowly. But there we are. I'm nowhere near my main fishing line. I'm taking right down, and I might as well tell you I was only a few turns off in that spindle there, or we'd been shattered. So here we are coming in. Gracious, he's still a mile off. By no means is this chap ready. Here he goes again. I am not tiring him out much, and he's not doing an awful lot to help. Heavy, I should say, is he's actually turning the boat. There he goes, here we go for another plunge. There he goes. Sound off. Now all this is to the good unless the hook comes off because he's tiring himself out. Now he's jagging, he's jagging the line with his cast. Never touch the reel at this stage or you will put the brakes on too quick. Gone a bit in the deep side. All these, oh, there he goes again. All these runs are to the good. And I must say, I have never felt such a strong fish this season. I do hope the hook is going to hold. This reminds me of Jaws and the flat calms when that huge beast was swimming around. Well, my problem here is the water's going suddenly quite still, and I fear this will take a little more time to tie them out. Now, here comes my bob coming up again. There's the bob fly surfacing. Now, he's coming now, bit by bit. We'll see him. Now, it's quite funny, I'm wearing polarized, and I can just see the white shape of him. And any jerks on my part here could bring about a bit of a disaster. He's coming slowly. My net is in the ready position. Just watch that you have everything nicely balanced, by the way. Now, I think it's about time, sir. Let me show you. There he is. There he is. Crater to net now. I'm going to try for him now. And we have him. Well, it's a beautiful coxie trout. He's gotten two flies. Yes, I couldn't have had him on one more second. He has got rid of the hook. It was the tail fly. I will have a look at this. This is a hard thing to do, is hold a sea trout by the tail. The tail tends to collapse, so we'll hold them by the gill. Now, there he is. Not nearly as big as I thought, but a good five to six pound in them. Caught in a fly off inch fad. A cock sea trout. And by the look of him, he's been in a good month or two. The weather here has been very, very poor for fly fishing. But this fellow decided to help make her day.
Well, we've been loitering in Lomond since way back in early April, and we now find ourselves pulling down the final curtain in another season in Loch Lomond. This hasn't been, for me, a particularly bumper season. It was brought about mainly by the tonnage of rainfall we've had since way back in early April. A year ago, we had a massive drought in Loch Lomond, and this year has more than amply made up for it. Talk about rain, I thought it would never stop at one stage. It presented me personally with problems in my day off. The lock was either rising, or certainly not falling very much, rising to levels that made it very, very difficult to spot where the fish might have altered their lives to. However, there have been an enormous amount of fish caught, rain or no rain, and it's almost a welcome ingredient as the season comes to an end and allows the fish to scamper up the burns and rivers to complete their long and hazardous time in fresh water and get on with the spawning. Well, personally, I'll be going home now and looking out my tackle, sorting out flies and lures and sprout mounts and whatnot, and already I'll be thinking of another season in Loch Lomond. But the main thing is, maybe you yourself will enjoy an absolutely bumper season in Lomond next year. Tight lines. <laughs>